Does one really keep the grid Reynolds number uh, uh, small? That's, you know, that, that's, it's easy to just, you know, juggle with some numbers and come up with something that looks like a Reynolds number and say, oh, it should be. And it's easy to say uh, all this stuff. I do not know for sure that it is always beneficial to do the viscous part implicitly. I'm hearing from someone whose community does not believe that. And I really have no, um, uh, do not know about what is done in higher Reynolds number communities. That I don't. I, in, my, in my own little community, which is, that does hydrodynamic stability, which does pattern formation, does low Reynolds number of turbulence, this is what people do. But I have not tested it myself, and I do not know that in higher Reynolds numbers this would hold up. Possibly doing all explicit is fine. I mean, I don't mean by fine, I mean possibly you don't gain anything by doing partially implicit. That's quite possible, and I'm quite ready to hear evidence from any of you or anybody that, that that's the case whether that is a numerical test that you've done or something that you've read in literature. Okay, so let me know if you feel like it. Uh, this is, I guess I should, I should have something in here that says, well, if it's filmed, uh, that says, maybe, <laughs> you know, that says, uh, this, this is what I think is so, but uh, no, uh, uh, no certainty about that, okay? When I write it, implicit time step in the viscous term will always be beneficial since its instability is more restrictive on delta T. I should have written that as a hypothesis uh, or else it is a custom or else it is proven in some place that I do not know. Okay, let me emphasize that. Because I wouldn't want you to think that some of the things that I know to be true uh, uh, are put in doubt by the fact that I say some other things that might not be true. Okay, so let us now go to the, um, the part where we do steady state solving and linear stability analysis. Unfortunately for those like you who do all explicit, you won't, it, it might not be uh, of help to you because what I'm talking about now is how to use an implicit, uh, an implicit viscous step to help you do steady state solving and, um, and, uh, and the linear stability analysis. So um, I'm writing Navier-Stokes equations schematically as LU plus N of Q. And um, <coughs> I'm assuming what I, what I came to before, which was that I'm using implicit linear and explicit nonlinear time stepping. I'm assuming that, okay? And for this, I make a, uh, I call this operator, this time stepping operator B, that's just my notation. And I call N plus L A, yeah, just my notation. Steady state solving is, uh, well, I've just written zero, the, instead of having d by dt of u, I write n of u plus lu. And Newton's method tells us to, um, uh, to linearize about capital U. And that, actually, okay, maybe this, yeah, this is better. This is what, okay, how many people know Newton's method already? Yes, Newton. How many people don't? Okay. Uh, so Newton's method is merely the approximation. Okay, remember I said linear systems are solvable, nonlinear systems are not. So what is uh, Newton's method? Is it, it's the local approximation of your system by a linear system. Obviously, you know what's the linear system that it would be? It would be the it would have the, it would be a line that would have the value that your function has and the slope. So what you would do is say this is your function green here, you know its value, you calculate its slope, you draw a line through your, uh, that has that, um, that has that slope and that value, and that gets you to where that line hits zero. You're trying to find the zeros of the green guy, but what you end up is finding the zeros of this line, because that you know how to do, and that gives you your new guess. Now, of course, that's not a zero of the green function. Here's the value of, 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 this, of the green function, and here's its slope. You follow that line till it hits zero, and that is your new guess, and so on. This is shown in a scalar example, but it can, you can write it for uh, any dimension by using Jacobians instead of derivatives, and we write it that, this way. We do a Taylor series expansion, as we've learned to do in dynamic systems, about some capital U, your current guess. That gives you, uh, here you are at some U, here's its slope, slope in the general sense, because this is a Jacobian matrix on a vector. Now you can, this is to find the zeros of this, this is a linear problem, you set, 
matrix times vector is equal to vector. You know, many times we've calculated Jacobians and that was to get you used to the idea that the Jacobian is a matrix that's to be evaluated at particular values. So you evaluate at your current guess. Matrix times vector is right-hand side. You can always solve that. Maybe it's costly, but you can solve it. And that gives you your little u here. And your little u um, is to be decremented from capital U because that is when the linear function would have hit a zero. So that is what Newton's method does. That's what's written here. Linear stability analysis, well, you take your, uh, you linearize about your steady state, your capital U here. And uh, that is um, this is a matrix. The n was not a matrix, but n sub u is because it's a Jacobian. Uh, since we call n plus l a, we call linear the Jacobian of a evaluated capital U capital a sub u here. And two main ways to do this are the um, uh, are either the inverse to act with the inverse or with the exponential, meaning. I'm going to take some u. I mean, this is an iterative method for doing steady state solving. This is an iterative method for doing, finding eigenvalues. Let me act over and over with, uh, with the exponential of the matrix on little u, and I will get uh, a, a, a new little u, that I'll, I'll, and I'll act again and again and again, and I will get searched for eigenvalues. Or I can act with, with the uh, inverse uh, on the little u, and again, uh, get something that will bring me to the uh, search for items. We'll talk about this in more detail shortly. Okay, um, there are, uh, yeah, okay, so we'll, we'll just uh, say that. Now, as we said now several times, we have a linear system, and we can always solve linear systems, but, okay, but it might be very costly. We've been talking about this all the, the while. We can do it directly, and directly means uh, uh, all the direct methods, they all have their, their bunch of different names, but they all mean the same thing. You say Gaussian elimination, you say LU, you say uh, back some, there's probably other names for it too. In the most general case, which we don't have, we mentioned this already, where we had a full matrix, um, it would take m squared um, to, to store, and the time for the LU decomposition is cubic. I mentioned this before. Okay. So uh, if you really took your thing, remember I, I counseled against this, if you construct matrices, these big matrices, and you send them off to a matrix uh, inverter, a system solver, it will take a huge time. It's time cubic, this, uh, particularly the, the, uh, the LU decomposition. If you have many systems to solve, then you, it's not MQ for each, me, if you have many systems to solve with different right-hand sides, but the same matrix, uh, you have only one time that's m cubed, and the other ones are m squared. Okay, so we've talked a lot about that and how that could be reduced or or can't or something. Now I'm going to start talking about iterative methods, in particular conjugate gradient. Method. How many people have heard of SOR? How many people have heard of Gauss Seidel? Things like that. Okay, those are not the methods I'm talking about. The methods I'm talking about are those that solve the system by acting with the matrix. You might say that's weird. I want to act with the inverse of the matrix. Uh, I'm going to act with the matrix to act with the inverse of the matrix, but it works under certain circumstances. These methods, okay, who's heard of conjugate gradient? So, okay. so my, the methods I'm talking about are variants of conjugate gradient. <coughs> conjugate gradient just requires you to be able to act with the matrix. Notice already for completely arbitrary matrices, a matrix action costs only m squared. Hi. Everything all right? Everything's good, Welcome thanks. Back. Okay. Um, a matrix uh, uh, action is m squared, uh, uh, and um, uh, so each product to, to make uh, to go from u to a u requires m squared operations. Um, conjugate gradient iteration uh, builds the solution. Okay, you notice that if you do u a u a squared u a cubed u a to the fourth u, in general, you're creating a bunch of linear and linear independent vectors. Right? And now you're going to build the solution, uh, by a way that I'm not telling you, and I don't think I will, build the solution out of those vectors. You're going to construct a superposition of u, a u, a squared u, a cube u, so on, um, that is your good guess to your solution. Um, in general, you would need uh, as many iterations as uh, the dimension of the vector, because your space is n-dimensional, and you would need that many vectors to form the complete space. 
So in general, you will have to form um, m of these vectors, each costs m squared because it's a matrix vector multiply, and thus it also takes a time m cubed. So in the worst case, where your matrix is full, you do full Gaussian elimination, the whole thing takes a time m cubed. In the worst case, conjugate gradient, you have a, no, a matrix not special, anything, also a time m cubed. You're not, there's no magic. It's not, it's not that conjugate gradient is going to replace Gaussian elimination. They take a time m cubed if your matrix is arbitrary, full, and everything. Now, why would we use conjugate gradient? Well, two reasons. One of them, we've already mentioned, maybe the matrix multiplication does not take a time m squared. That was all that stuff before. It takes a time that's more like m, or m log m, or something like that. It's much cheaper than m. Okay, and you might say, but we've been discussing where inversion also takes a time that's, that's, uh, that's cheap. Ah, but let me remind you what matrix I'm solving. Before, I was talking about things like the Laplacian. Now, I am talking about the Laplacian plus the linearization about, uh, uh, of the nonlinear term about the, um, uh, 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 about this, the current estimate, capital U, of the steady state. So I'm not just talking about the Laplacian anymore. I'm talking about a matrix which you know much less about, and which is going to vary with the problem, which is going to vary with the, as you proceed in your, in your computation. Okay? It's, it's not the Laplacian. Laplacian, we have tricks for inverting the Laplacian. This is more general. This is Laplacian plus n sub u. n sub u, it's, okay, acting with n sub u on a little u is like taking the nonlinear term, uh, the, the same kind of things that we did in the class when we linearize about little u, our big u dot grad big u becomes big u dot grad little u plus little u dot grad big u. That's what that means. n sub capital U on little u means this. And this is, so this is a matrix that we add to the Laplacian, and you know less about it. So it's not quite so obvious that um, that the same is. Okay. It's not quite so obvious that although we can act economically with our matrix, that we can also invert it economically. <coughs> we can act economically for the reasons that we were saying. That is to say, we have our Laplacian; it has our different it has different directions. We have the nonlinear terms. Well, maybe we can go to Fourier space. Uh, excuse me, go from Fourier space to physical space, do our multiplication there, come back. We can do various things. Maybe acting is not, doesn't cost very much, but inverting might. Maybe. Anyway. So, in any case, we're talking about a situation in which matrix action takes more like uh, linear uh, dependence on the number of unknowns and not quadratic. Okay. So that's the first point. The second point is that we need m independent directions. But maybe we don't. Maybe we, maybe somehow or other, uh, we generate uh, the number of directions that we need pretty quickly for whatever reason. Okay? And that's called uh, being well conditioned. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, uh, so a matrix is a well conditioned if it's a, a basic, I think it's more complicated than that, but I don't really know it in very well in detail. Some of you, you know, probably none of you are in uh, numerical analysis, none of you are specialists in that. No. There are people who study these things, not me. Uh, basically, there's something called condition number, which is the ratio of eigenvalues of a matrix. If that ratio is close to one, you're in good shape. If that ratio is very far from one, you're in bad shape. Um, so the perfect, the perfect uh, matrix is a multiple of the identity. Uh, and uh, the worst, one, well, there. Um, and in fact, this is, just a moment, um, uh, well, we'll talk about okay to this in just a moment. So what can we do about it? Our matrix is as it is, so it's well-conditioned or not. Well, there's something called preconditioning, and most of you have probably heard this term, even if you haven't used it. Who's heard preconditioning? Because indeed, most, ma ma most of the time in CFD is spent solving linear systems, and uh, that's what really, that's the big problem, and so uh, people want to find methods to speed that up. I'm not surprised preconditioning should be part of your vocabulary. What is preconditioning? Well, uh, you're trying to solve AU equals V, that's equivalent to solving PAU equals PV for any invertible matrix P. Uh, it's best understood by looking at the extreme cases. Extreme case, P is uh, the inverse of A. Well, then, you have the solution, U equals P, uh, A inverse V. But, of course, if you could do that, you wouldn't be looking to solve it, would you? But that just shows uh, how preconditioning could be, uh, could be really effective, right? That's the one extreme case. 
So that's something that's hard to do by assumption, but very effective. The opposite, supposing P were the identity. That's easy to do. You don't do anything. But that's not effective. So you're trying to interpolate now. You're trying to find some P that's neither as effective but hard as A inverse, nor as easy but ineffective as the identity. Okay, so that, I think that's the best way to understand. What you're looking for is an approximate inverse. Something that's not as hard as the true inverse, but is, has some, good, some properties of the inverse. Um, so in typical case that we're talking about, say a 3D case with 100 in each direction, the eigenvalues are gonna, uh, of the Laplacians, say, would go from 1 to minus 30,000, say, you know, in that order. So that's a huge condition number, right? The, the smallest eigenvalue is, is 1, the biggest is 30,000. Um, I haven't taken into account here the eigenvalues that of, of the whole uh, A matrix, which are the, the eigenvalues of the sum are not the sum of the eigenvalues. We talked about that, I think, uh, in the class. I think we said that's only true if the matrices commute, and that's not true of L and then U. But let's say more or less. We can say more or less that if the Reynolds numbers that I deal with, again, perhaps this is different for the, the eigenvalues of AU are very similar to those of L. And the fact that they have a huge range comes from the huge range of the eigenvalues of L. And that is the whole point. The whole point is that a lot of effort has been devoted in all the different CFD communities to learning how to invert the Laplacian. Everybody's in every community, every kind of discretization method used, everybody knows how to solve Poisson's equation in electromagnetism, in plasma physics, in chemistry, you know, uh, theoretically. Everybody is solving Poisson equation. Everybody is solving Helmholtz equation. And so, in fact, you have this huge technology. All your communities have spent a lot of time learning how to invert L. And if inverting L is kind of like inverting A, then you can use that. And that's, that's my whole point here. That's why I said to you, uh, uh, sir in the back, I, oh, I hate to embarrass you. Hello, hello, hi. Uh, that's why I said to you that since you use all explicit methods, it's not going to be so useful to you because the whole rest of the class is about how to use the fact that people know how to in are inverting the Laplacian to, to, to do these other things. So uh, it could be, if, if you're in your community, you don't invert the Laplacian, then maybe this is not so useful to you. But I don't know, maybe. Depends. Even in your community, people invert the Poisson equation to solve them for the pressure, right? You do that? You have a pressure Poisson equation? Okay. So maybe some of the things that I have to say are, uh, maybe not. Don't. Okay. So that's this next slide here. Uh, that's nice to say that we're going to invert L, but uh, where are we going to get the inverse of L? Well, I already told you, it's already present in a time-stepping method. Let us pretend that we have, claim that we have this implicit explicit time stepping method, I minus delta T L inverse times I minus delta T N, that is an explicit step of N, an implicit step of L. Let's use that to get a U of T plus delta T. We subtract U of T, that's minus I over here. Now let me get this red guy, make it, uh, make it a common denominator, that means I have to multiply by I minus delta TL over here. And that means that now I get, um, uh, uh, excuse me, then I continue doing algebra. I have I minus I, I pull out a delta T, and I get this. And what does this tell me? This tells me that, okay, what I'm looking for, remember, my steady state is something such that N plus L on it is zero. So this is telling me that if n, uh, the, the, the roots of n plus l, things used such that n plus l on u is zero, are the same as those which are not changed by one of these implicit, explicit Euler time steps. Just this, this equation here. The roots of n plus l are the same as the roots of, I might, of b, remember I call this b minus i, same roots. Okay. So maybe we should find roots of B minus I. Why should we find roots of B minus I? Why shouldn't we just find roots of N plus L? How does this help us? Well, if we take delta T very, very large, and by large, I don't mean the one that's used for time stepping. I mean like 100, like 1,000. <coughs> then this is like L inverse. And I was saying it might be nice to use L inverse as a preconditioner. 
Now you're going to say, wait a minute, delta t very, very large, isn't everything going to blow up? No, because all, look at all these things. These things are equalities. This is algebra. This is not Taylor series. When we, when we use a, an implicit, explicit Euler scheme to do um, time stepping, we are using the fact that for small, that if we do a Taylor series of this, meaning for small delta t, this is an approximation to the exponential. I remind you that that's what we're trying to do for linear equations anyway. What a time stepping scheme is, is an approximation to the exponential, uh, if you're doing it on a linear uh, operator. You're doing a, an approximation of the exponential. Okay, so that's true, and you better not take a, a delta t that's too large, or it will not only not be a good ex, uh, approximation to the exponential, but it will blow up. We just said that uh, several times. But that all that has that approximately equal sign. This calculation here had equal signs all the way, and those are true equal signs. They're not. Appro there's no approximation here. This is as true for delta t equals 0 0.01 as it is for delta t equals 100. It is true for all delta t. It is mere algebra. <coughs> this is not. This is Taylor series. This is algebra. Okay. This has a dot, dot, dot. This is true for up to delta t and not to delta t squared. This has no dot, dot, dot. This is true. You can take it whatever size you want. If you take, and this is the interpolation that we were talking about, those extreme cases. If we take delta t very, very small, then this is like multiplying n plus l by i. It doesn't really change n plus l. It's not a very effective preconditioner. If we take delta t very large, that's like multiplying, that's multiplying by l inverse, effectively. And we claim that this is a good preconditioner. And I have found it to be so. Um, so um, let's see, what should I say? OK, so a typical Newton step will look like this. We have a right-hand side here. This is n plus l multiplied by this i minus delta t l inverse, which I don't have to do. It's not a, it's not a separate step. What I'm doing is taking the difference between two times steps, taking u of t plus delta t, where delta t is huge, minus u of t. And over here, I have the same thing, but the linearization, like the derivative. Instead of n, I have n sub u. So on the right-hand side, I had capital U dot grad u. And on the left-hand side, I've just replaced that by big U dot grad little u plus little u dot grad big u. And another thing that I have done to linearize it uh, when you do this is you also have to make this has inhomogeneous boundary conditions, possibly, or, or bulk forces, both. And this one has no, neither of those. Remember, when you linearize, you have to set, not only do you eliminate the quadratic terms, but also the constant terms, the inhomogeneous terms, like bulk forces, or like inhomogeneous boundary conditions. And then this thing is taking the quadratic term and turning it to that. And uh, so you need to be able to create this, and you need to be able to create this but that's all you need to do because people have written <coughs> nice routines such that if you give them a subroutine that does an, a matrix vector multiply, and note that this matrix vector multiply is just like taking a time step, linearized time step. If you know how to do that, it will then construct for you the best solution out of those repeated actions. We'll go back to this thing here. We will use matrix vector multiply. All we need to do is give a conjugate gradient routine. We do not give it a matrix. We give it a procedure that acts with the matrix. The one difficulty is that conjugate gradient is guaranteed to converge, but only for symmetric positive definite matrices, such as the Laplacian. It's negative definite. It's symmetric definite, I should say, where the eigenvalues are all of one sign. And that's true for L, but it is not true for Full, uh, the one with the Jacobian. With the one with the Jacobian, it is not symmetric definite. And for that, there are many rival methods that are generalizations of conjugate gradient for non-symmetric uh, definite matrices. They're called, and you'll know some of these names, GM-res, biconjugate gradient stable, ortho-res, QMR, IDR. You heard some of these names? Yeah. These are different methods. None of them is always good, otherwise that's, that one would win and the other ones would be eliminated, wouldn't be used anymore. 
you know, for finding eigenvalues, there the complete eigenvalue set of eigenvalues for matrix. There's one algorithm that is in use. It's called QR, and that is the one because no other one is as good. If that were the situation for solving non-symmetric systems, it would be uh, uh, iteratively by these kind of methods. That one would be available, and the other ones would not be. As it is. We are in a state, and perhaps always will be, or hopefully not, where no one method is best. Different, different. You can all, for all the methods that exist. There, you, people write papers where they find a system such that this one is better than that one, and they find another system such that that one is better than this one. So that one is still that's still an experimental science. But the one that I have found to work for my problems is biconjugate gradient stabilized, which was uh, described in 19. <coughs> <clears throat> and um, okay, let me not talk. About, let's uh, relax a little bit by looking at some pictures, right? Um, you've seen this picture before. Remember, I, I uh, talked about this. There's multiple steady states. All of these are pictures of convection heated from below in a cylinder. These pictures are all obtained um, experimentally at the exactly the same parameter values, right? I mean, I know I mentioned this in some class, but maybe not. Uh, maybe those that are frowning were not there for that class. So this is, this is an experimental result. And then uh, I did some numerical work um, with a PhD student where we reproduce these different patterns. Okay, note, okay, let's go back to some of the lessons that we learned. Some of them can be explained by symmetry. That is to say, this one and this one are the same except white is black. One of them is hot fluid rising, the other is cold fluid falling. If this one exists, necessarily that one exists. So too, this one and this one are gotten by symmetry. One of them is hot fluid fall rising, the other is cold fluid falling. The, in the Boussinesque equations, there is those two are the same. It doesn't care whether it's hot rising or cold falling. That's not true uh, in, for non-Boussinesque convection, but it is true. Here. So <coughs> the fact that you have these two is, um, but, then, so, uh, but then the others are not explained by symmetry. They're just a whole bunch of different patterns. And so we used a time stepping, we used the UDT equals Poussinesque equations, and we got all of these patterns. We got all the ones that they had, plus some that they hadn't. These are fields of size, um, these are vectors, we can say of size 300,000, when you take into account that we have the velocity, three components of velocity plus the temperature, and we have 40 radial uh, modes and 120 theta modes and 20 Z modes. And these are pictures of things that we found from time-dependent simulations. So you see that we find that for a fixed a Rayleigh number, you can have many different solutions just like that. They call that one Mercedes. You can see why. Right. Mercedes. So we called it Mercedes <laughs> also, and then we gave we followed that and gave other imaginative names like pizza, <laughs> like CO, a little less imaginative. But still. Were you hungry, or, or were they hungry yeah, when they met? <laughs> so. Okay, so this is nice, but this some people call this a bifurcation diagram, but I do not. This is not a bifurcation diagram. It doesn't explain what are the bifurcations, who came from what, what kind of bifurcation created these. This is just a nice pictorial summary of, 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 uh, of various runs. It is not a bifurcation diagram. We sought to make a bifurcation diagram, and we did. That is to say, here are all those branches that you saw here. But properly arranged, excuse me, this is, this is some, this is the temperature at a certain point divided by the Rayleigh number. And here are all the branches you saw, plus many more. Because you can see, this doesn't explain everything. What, what's this? What's this where you jump from this to this? What, what do you mean? I mean, this, the fact that this stopped meant that we, could, it didn't, we didn't have two rolls anymore. It made a transition to pizza. What happened? Did this branch stop existing? Did it, was there a saddle node bifurcation that made it stop existing? Was there a pitchfork bifurcation that made it lose stability? Where did it really appear? What, what happened here? What is this? And, and, and what's this? And, and, and what's this? And this is really the range in which we found those things numerically by doing time stepping, by meaning, as if we were perfect experimentalists, we're changing the temperature, we're, and for every one of these states, we change the Rayleigh number up and down until it stopped and still made a transition to something else. So this is a true range of stability. But what happened? In the terms that we have studied in class, what happened? What, what, uh, this is as I say, this is it's nice, but it's just a summary. It's like writing to making a picture in your experimental uh, um, notebook, a summary of, of, our, of our runs. So we turned our time-stepping code into a steady-state code 
by this, this means that I was talking about here, with conjugate gradient and Newton's method and the whole